This, This is Wildcast. Is Wildcast. Hi there, and welcome to Wildcast Late Edition. We have a really special guest today. We have Rick Schwartz, our San Diego Zoo ambassador, mm -hmm. here with us to tell us a little bit about a new exhibit. Yeah, we're, uh, we're very happy to be here. We're going all over Tucson today and tomorrow, and it's wonderful that we're able to stop by here with some of our animals. We're here to talk about our Australian outback area, which is uh, basically we've had koalas and Australian animals for a long time, but not one real centralized location to really show people. If you go to Australia, this is going to be your experience. These are the, the great animals there. So we have uh, Australian Outback opening the end of May. It's been under construction for a year and a half now. And it's a nearly $7 million project, about three acres of the zoo being completely redesigned. And we brought along some animals to, to help uh, tell We're you excited. the story of what's going on there. And this beautiful girl here is Peaches. She is a Moluccan cockatoo, and cockatoos are only found in Australia and some of the surrounding island areas of the, the continent of Australia. And cockatoos come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Primarily, though, you're going to find them white with then a unique coloration on their crest. It's beautiful. So this is where peaches get their name, sort of a peach Aww. color there, or the salmon color of the Moluccan Fitting. cockatoo. <laughs> uh, there's some that have yellow and some that are just all white. Uh, there's some cockatoos that are all black with some highlights on them. <laughs> Uh, there's even one called a rose-breasted cockatoo, which has a rose-dusting color on the chest and more of a gray body. So, so all the cockatoos variety. are from Australia, though? Correct, Even though, yeah. I mean, it's a common pet in America, right? Well, you know, and that's, they, that's one thing part of being a parrot is uh, they were taken quite a bit from the wild. All over the world where they're native to, they were, they were taken illegally and initially kept as pets. They're very challenging to have as pets. There's a, it's a huge responsibility. Um, you know, and then some people actually have to write them into, into your will because they'll live 50 or 60 years. Oh, wow. As right. in five zero or six zero, yeah. <laughs> they'll so outlive. they'll outlive their owners yeah. quite often, and they do bond with the family they live with. So you go on vacation, it can be very painful for them emotionally. So there's a lot to consider. But yeah, people do keep these animals as pets, or they do try to. But we kind of really want to, if, if people are interested, they see what a beautiful bird, I want that in my home, do a lot of homework, do a lot of research. Understand you have to have a specialized vet, specialized diet, and it's a huge time commitment. And they could just come to the zoo and see peaches Right, there. exactly. You can come <laughs> to the zoo and see any of our birds there and many, many of the other animals. And, and cockatoos are beautiful, but Australia also has a lot of animals that mm, might not be considered as beautiful. Oh, and we have another one. <laughs> we have a, a cane toad right here. This amphibian here is actually not a native species in the sense that they weren't indigenous. They were brought in by the Australian people to hopefully uh, maintain the beetle population of a parasitic beetle that was damaging the, um, the sugar cane fields. So the idea was let's bring these toads in. They're actually Surinama toads. And uh, they refer to them now as cane toads, though, because they live so well in the cane uh, areas, the sugar cane plantations. The problem being, of course, they didn't take to eating beetles so much, but they do love to eat a wide variety of other amphibians, small mammals, and reptiles. So they're damaging to the uh, indigenous species. So are you guys pulling them out now? To well, the, the Australian government is working on trying to control that population because not only are they damaging to the indigenous species that they eat, but if you look at what looks like two giant shoulder pads on either side here, <laughs> those are poison glands. Oh. So now there's, there's a difference between venomous and poisonous. If a venomous species like a rattlesnake were to bite you, it injects venom. But if you ate it, it wouldn't poison you. The cane toad is poisonous in the sense that if he bit you, it would be no big deal. It would be like someone just gumming you to death. Uh, <laughs> but if you were to bite him or eat him, the poison would be, or toxin would be in there that could oh. potentially hurt you quite a bit. Smaller animals, such as birds, and, uh, birds of prey and other uh, predatory animals that do eat the cane toad, do pass away from doing so sometimes. So it's also been a problem on that side of the ecosystem wow. uh, with the introduction there. So, so I noticed he's kind of puffing up. Right, now he's twice the size he was when he first <laughs> yeah. showed up, huh? Well, perhaps in his mind, either you look like you want to eat him or just me discussing eating him was upsetting. So he <laughs> ballooned up. That's their defense. The idea is similar to the puffer fish. If I puff up twice the size I was, maybe you'll reconsider trying to eat me. But I'm going to hand off the cane toad here. We got a really cool lizard. Oh, wow. We'll take peaches thing. over there. Thank you. <laughs> This is a blue tongue skink. Now, a lot of people look at this and they freak out because it's a scaled animal and it's so it's scary big. looking and it's big. <laughs> These guys are really laid back and very cool. And if he opens his mouth, let's see if he does, you'll see his tongue is very bright blue. He's getting shy. Now, a lot of times, bright colors in the wild, there, just there for a second, go. you saw it. The bright colors in the wild represent I'm poisonous or venomous. Mm -hmm. Now, there's always the exception to the rule. Cane toad was very just kind of nondescript brown color. Mm -hmm. This animal, brightly colored tongue, not venomous or poisonous. So sometimes Mother Nature plays a couple tricks on us. <laughs> this, little, this lizard is currently being studied because they're one of the few species that is doing well with urbanization. 
We usually think urban sprawl, the growth of the city, damages population, damages natural areas, makes it very challenging for the native species to live. And that's very true for most all species. Every now and then, exception to the rule, the uh, blue tongue skink here is doing very, very well in the urban area, living in the city. How so? And, well, just their populations are strong. They okay. grow, uh, they obviously have very large lizard. They'll, they'll get a little bit bigger than this, live for a long time, find places to hibernate, find plenty of food to eat, which is usually bugs and insects, things of that nature. And uh, for whatever reason, they're quite populous and do quite well. So they're being studied, actually, to see what is it that they have been able to do to adjust to right. humans being so impactful to their environment. Very interesting. Does he have a name? Ah, uh, yes. This is Elway. Okay. Yes, <laughs> very Australian name. <laughs> All right. Oh, and another bird. Yes, another bird. I'm gonna hold on to this one now. Here we go. Oh, oh. Okay. Woo. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> the skink is not gonna eat you. I promise. Aww. There you go. We'll get you settled. Hey, 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 hey. hey. You're okay. There you go. We're bringing the the buddy. All right. We have. Uh, two kookaburras here, and kookaburras are sometimes referred to as a laughing kookaburra. And there's a particular thing we can do as humans to hear that laugh. It's called a trill. So if you can go really loudly for me. Ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> they were doing it, they were doing it earlier here. today. They were doing it earlier today, so perhaps they're, they're all tired out. But the kookaburra does actually sometimes refer to, like I said, the laughing kookaburra. They do a call that sounds a lot like a human laugh or even a, what we would consider a loud monkey type sound. And the sound of the kookaburra is used quite often in television and movies to kind of give ambiance to jungle scenes, you know, mm. in Africa or, or South America. But this species is only found in Australia and not really a jungly area, more of a wooded area. Uh, it's a little what would consider sparse compared to a jungle. And you look at that beak there, they are carnivorous. Uh, these are uh, the largest of the kingfisher family, and there's kingfisher uh, birds all shapes and sizes and colorations. And that beak is well known for being able to pierce right into the water and grab. You gonna start? Do it again. <laughs> nope. Oh, no. Hold on. Hold on. There you go. Hold on. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> But anyhow, that, that beak allows them to hunt quite well. They can spear with it and swallow their food whole. Uh, they're very fast, too, when they want to be for hunting purposes. And they also are pretty cool in the sense that you know, that call that we're trying to get them to do is a location call. They'll live in family groups. So a hatchling will grow up. And instead of flying off and creating its own habitat or its own, uh, excuse me, its own territory, they'll live in family groups, maybe with their family for several years. And that trilling and that call, they'll do it morning uh, and then again at dusk in the evening. And sometimes that gives them a nickname also than the Bushman's alarm clock because they're dead on every day at the same yeah. time. They do their calls and their trills uh, and they're laughing, if you will. So are they full grown at this point? Yes, these are two adult birds, yeah. And they are, they're, they're funny. I mean, it's, if you can watch the one on my right hand here as I move my hand back and forth. Oh. See how the head doesn't move? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. In flight or even while hunting for food, if they are hanging out in a tree with the wind blowing, let's say the branch is moving, they use their eyesight to find their prey. If they kept moving in the tree, swinging back and forth, it's hard to focus on that one prey item or while in flight. So you can see that, that movement there. So you left hand, maybe, nope, not And what much. do they generally eat? Well, they're carnivorous, so they'll eat anything that they can really catch that's small enough. So insects, is small Elway rodents, in reptiles. Danger? Elway is too big. Elway's okay. good. He's, right. he, as far as he's <laughs> concerned, he's a possible place to perch, and that's about it. All right, all right. Of course, too, we have uh, the rather infamous Kangaroos. Kangaroo. Yes. Our whole studio is That's very excited to see Sheila that. Sheila right there. And she is a mother kangaroo, a red kangaroo, full grown female. Males can get much larger than Sheila can. In fact, uh, her male mate uh, that helped produce diesel here uh, is almost six feet tall when they stand up completely. Now, kangaroos are well known for boxing. Mm -hmm. They don't box in the traditional sense like we cartoons tend to do so. The behavior they do though when males challenge each other does look a bit like boxing. They'll get up on their hind feet all the way, stand up nice and tall, use their tail as a kickstand, grab with their front feet. So they'll punch and they'll grab, punch and grab, and if they get in close enough, they'll actually push back onto their tail using that as a sing single stand and kick with the back foot. And that can be the blow that can be devastating to us humans uh, and or to even the other kangaroo they're fighting with to make the other one go, okay, you know what, maybe you can go ahead and have this area, I'll, I'll move on over there. So yeah. do they usually do that to fight over area? Usually you'll see like males doing that during mating season. Oh. Uh, so they're, they're jockeying for who's going to be in charge of the mob, a group of kangaroos referred to as a mob. And so um, they'll, they'll jockey for who gets to be in charge and gets the breeding rights. So uh, a kind of just interesting behavior there. You know, just people like look at little mob, diesel right? here and they think, why do you have them all folded up in this bag? That can't be very comfortable. But again, look at Sheila over here, his mom. 
her pouch really isn't that big. And this guy, if he had the opportunity, he'd try and squeeze back in there right now. They love being in the pouch. If we had a pouch big enough, she'd probably pop into it also. <laughs> uh, something they love to do, they usually dive in head first, so you see legs sticking out of the pouch sometimes. But one thing you have to know about marsupials in general, which kangaroos are marsupials, along with koalas and Tasmanian devils and anything you can think of, even opossum that we have here in the United States, that when they're born, they're very small and underdeveloped. And then they have to crawl from the birth canal into the pouch. Hi, buddy. And that's where they will suckle and they'll develop for the next few months. Depending on the species, they could be in there for six months, sometimes nine months, just depending on what animal you're talking about. Oh, so, so how precious. much bigger will diesel Well, diesel's get? a male, so he could potentially get as tall as I am. Oh, wow. Now, again, when they move, they tend to move hunched over. We see them so they're, they're a, a more of an elongated position, like a dog would be. But if when Sheila stands up, she's easily, uh, you know, four and a half feet or so, and the males can get much taller than her. Huh. What so do what, what do kangaroos eat? Well, kangaroos are herbivores, so they spend mm -hmm. a lot of time foraging for food on the ground, the grasses and the, and the plants. Do you want to get out and boogie for a little bit? You can. Aww. So when they do that, it, when a mom has a joey in the pouch and she bends over then to eat, so here's a great Sheila. See how tall she is now? Yeah. Is she standing up like that? Where before, when she's moving, you're thinking, oh, she's much smaller, no big. But she can get much taller. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Tell mama. Tell mama. <laughs> but essentially, so as you can't get in there, you're not going to fit. <laughs> Silly girl. So when Sheila would be going around foraging for food, grasses and small plants, the pouch then gets down close to the ground also. And as Joey's hanging out, that's how they start to learn what a kangaroo is supposed to eat. Because as mom's feeding, their face is put right there in front of it. And they start to taste test and enjoy it. And, and they move on from there. So how long do kangaroos live? Well, they can live into their 20s quite easily. Uh, just like with people with many of our species, it depends on genetics and, and nutrition and health like that. We're fortunate at the San Diego Zoo, we have a great vet. Oh, we got the table. <laughs> there goes the mic. We, got, we have a great vet staff and nutritional staff, and so these guys, we tend to see live a lot longer in the zoo environment than they do in the wild because of that. Are you getting excited, Sheila? Do you want to get in there? Sheila wants to get in there. She does. It's a, you know, it's a very comforting thing for marsupials to get back. It's kind of like when we get snuggled up in this comfort yeah. blanket that we associate from our childhood. It's kind of that same sensation for them. A little comfort zone. A little comforting, yeah, exactly. exactly. We're pretty excited to see launching the, the back at the mm -hmm. end of May because we're going to feature all of these great uh, animals from all over Australia. And then, of course, we do have the largest koala population outside of Australia. So we're pretty excited to have a whole brand new area for them for people to come and enjoy and, and be able to so see right all of now, those guys. they're already in a separate area. Well, like yeah, we the area where the koalas originally were has been under construction for about a year and a half. So we did move them to a temporary uh, exhibit area where there's only, I think, about three or four of the almost 25 that we have on exhibit. Oh, okay. The rest are all in a back holding area until the new exhibit is done that way. Uh, and one of the great things, too, if people can't get out to the San Diego Zoo for the opening, of course, it's going to be there for a long time. But you can also go to our website, sandiegozoo.org, and we have brand new, just as of the end of January, installed an HD camera so you can do a koala cam. You can see the koalas at the San Diego Zoo right from your own laptop or wherever. And uh, also then you could click on the uh, polar bear cam or panda cam or any of those things, too, and, and really get an idea of all the great stuff we're doing at the San Diego Zoo. Okay. I did get to see the uh, koala cam, but I looked at night, and so it was, you know, dark. Dark, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. live. So if you're looking at night, it's <laughs> yeah, going to be yeah, dark. I'm we sure don't flood them with light. <laughs> and another thing to keep in mind, too, koalas, it's okay, buddy. It's okay, buddy. <laughs> you won't have been Elway, huh? <laughs> Best friends. Well, feeling saucy. <laughs> Settle down, Sheila. So one thing to remember, because it is live, too, and a lot of these animals, like the panda and the koala, do a lot of sleeping because right. they are herbivores. Mm -hmm. So they conserve their energy. So it's not always action-packed footage, but it is kind of cute to tune in and see what's going on with the animals. So other than the ones that you brought us here today, what, what other animals are there? There's going to be a exhibit? wide variety of bird species. One of the cool things about the way they've set the aviary up is although there's certain areas where certain species can't commingle, visually as you look through the aviary, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> visually as you look through the aviary, you're going to see a wide variety of different species than like you would normally in the forest, just sort of a condensed area. Uh, we'll have an animal called an echidna, which is really great. Google that if you would. Uh, because it's the only other egg-laying mammal in the world. We're, we're well versed in the platypus being an egg-laying mammal. Mm -hmm. The echidna is a relative of theirs, also an egg-laying mammal. So okay. all sorts of great animals to come check out and see. Now will Diesel and Elway and all these guys that we've seen, will we be able to see them at the zoo eventually? No, these guys are our ambassadors, so they do all the traveling, traveling. like so myself. They're you, so they're the prima donnas. Exactly. Okay. These guys, right. these guys are the great ones with the great attitudes that they get along. Well, they like to wrestle. but fun. 
They like to have fun and they're very comfortable, as you can tell. They wouldn't be exhibiting play behaviors if they weren't having fun and comfortable. Mm -hmm. These are animals that do uh, studio work for us all the time, do presentations for us all the time. So this for them is just another day, as it always is. Our animals that live there at the San Diego Zoo permanently, this would be a little foreign to them. So we're not going to pull them off exhibit either for these type of right. adventures that we have. We wouldn't want to leave the exhibits ent empty for everyone else who's coming there to see them. Right. Very cool. <laughs> You're going to so pull that <laughs> off, aren't you, buddy? <laughs> so the exhibit opens in May. Um, is that right? Yes, the end of May. We'll okay. have our grand opening and then it'll be open from then on. Very cool. And they can find information San Diego on the website? SanDiegoZoo.org. Yeah, you know, the best place to go is SanDiegoZoo.org and now we just added, we have a whole new sort of leap of a new, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, <laughs> of a website all about our uh, Outback area. And there's a whole awesome. of, uh, thing you can do online. Uh, if you want to join into our competition, you can actually win tickets to come out to the zoo for the opening, hotel stay and everything. So go to the San Diego Zoo.org, click on the uh, Koalifornia, as they call it, competition, and see how you can enter through Twitter or uh, Facebook or, or any of the other social media ways to, to be able to that do amazing. that. sounds yeah, amazing. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much We're for so joining glad. us. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so for having us. So glad to meet all the animals. Glad you don't mind us turning the place up. <laughs> <laughs> you betcha. We'll be smelling good for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Maybe months. Right. Right. Well, we wish you safe travels, and thank you so thank much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do we?